The feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and of course we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up, the Prime Minister's policy of sending migrants to Rwanda faces further delays. Who'd have guessed it as Labour vows to oppose the plans in a crucial vote tomorrow? They claim each deportation will cost as much as sending six people to space. I know who I'd send. Plus, eco-nuts are eliminated as police will no longer be an acceptable defence for vandalism. Common sense at last. And gone to pot. Road repairs are at record highs amidst warnings. Our highways are heading towards breaking point. Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here at Talk TV. Get ready for another blockbuster of a show, because I'll be telling you who's behind the net zero revolution and why they're so desperate to scare us all. I'll be explaining how your local council wants to treat drivers as wallets on four wheels. And we'll bring you Labour Chancellor-in-waiting, Rachel Reeves, with a policy speech without, guess what, any policy. Brilliant. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Let's get ready to rumble. The next episode in the never-ending soap opera that is the safety of Rwanda bill is coming to a House of Lords near you on Wednesday. Yep, tomorrow, peers will have another swipe at the legislation that they sought to shackle with 10 amendments last week and the MPs voted down late last night. Hard to believe, isn't it, that we're still talking about Rwanda and yet nothing is going on. If you could collectively just add up all the words that have been spoken about it and maybe get a pound for every one of them, maybe the government would actually not be in deficit anymore. My panel are here with me tonight, Deputy Political Editor of the Sun, Ryan Sabi, journalist and broadcaster Emma Wolfe, uh, and political analyst Mike Indian. Very good evening to all of you. I mean, we were told last night, early, early doors, that all 10 House of Lords amendments would be knocked down. They were all knocked down. It seemed to be a colossal waste of time. Um, some people seem to think it was a good idea that the House of Lords had a look. Now they're going to have another look, and Labour peers now are saying that they're going to block it. So, you know, how much, much more of this are we supposed to take, Ryan? It could go on and it could be all done and dusted tomorrow. I right. doubt it will be. The likelihood is we'll have um, as the, the well known phrase ping pong going yeah. between the Commons and, uh, and, and the House of it's Lords. It's more like whiff waff. It, it is, is a little bit. As it literally travels that. <laughs> wobble, wibble ball. Exactly. That piece of legislation goes from the Commons to the Lords. It's right. about 50, 50 yards. And there's that great ceremony that goes in between. What I think you will have, what will happen to, uh, tomorrow is you will have the Lords voting and probably accepting. Um, six or seven amendments. Yeah. Uh, the reason is that it, it will be up to the Tory peers. They have to get enough people in to vote it down. Yeah. They've called these people up from all around the world. Mm. You know, they, you are a Tory peer. You need to be here on this day. They may not get enough. Yeah. Um, so there's not enough of them, is there? There, there, there is just about right. if they all turn up. Mm. However, some have got on business, some yeah. are ill. You've got to, you've got to call, call them all in. Um, so I think you'll have six or seven. Um, will we'll go through. And one of the reasons it may go through is there won't be enough sort of One Nation Tories ready to give mm. in just yet. Right. So I think when they do, the bill will go through and it'll be a no problem. Because there's plenty of Tories that still don't think the Rwanda bill is a good bill. And there's plenty of Tories who will rebel, I presume, in the House of Lords. But everyone keeps telling me that this is just like 1979. You know, I remember 1979. I mean, you guys might not because you don't look old enough. But, you know, 1979, when, when we'd had such terrible, terrible times with the Labour government and such awful times with, uh, you know, rubbish piling up and you know, all sorts of strikes everywhere, you can bury your dead and all of that, you know. But we keep getting references to it. And I remember the last time they had the House of Lords in this situation where they were sort of shipping Lords in from hospitals and, you know, mm. bringing people get, in on stretchers. Getting them out of the morgues. You know, get, yeah, exactly yeah. right. So, I mean, are we going back to the 70s? I mean, it was a pretty bad time. I don't know if we're going back to the 70s, but this, this whole deportation, this farce just has to stop. This yeah. Is, Weird that every Rishi Sunak, every time he mentions Rwanda, right. we're just reminded of how utterly incompetent the Home Office right. has been under 14 years of his, of yes. his, you know, party's rule. We've also found out this week that Rwanda are not even ready for this, right? 
They've only got 150 beds in the yeah. hostel. So the idea that they could take, they make any dent in our backlog of hundreds of thousands of migrants. Yeah. I mean, the whole policy is a joke. And yet Rishi Sunak has chosen this as the, the hill on which mm. he's going to die. He's obsessed with this. Oh, he's no. completely fixated on it. Rwanda is a byword. Mm. Well, it's a joke. It's a byword right. for failure. Even people who might politically be on his side might say that he's obsessed with Rwanda and obsessed with, with a tiny, tiny problem if, uh, of our entire immigration system. As Emma says, you know, the utility it's not... of the policy is not worth the outcome. And you know, in answer to your question about the return to the 70s, the Callaghan government didn't have a working majority at that point. They lost the vote of confidence in mm. 1979 by one vote, yeah. famously. Rishi Sunak has a comfortable working majority. He proved that on Monday night, despite the recent by-election losses. He still has a working majority of 50-odd yeah. seats in the, in the House. He, yeah, he started with 80. But he doesn't behave like a prime minister <laughs> who's in control. We've had no. these two of his prominent rivals in cabinet having to go out and publicly say in, in the press they are not out to try and oust him before right. the election. Penny Mordaunt, Kemi Badenoch. Mm. So Rishi Sunak doesn't behave like a man who has a working majority, but he feels like the last days of the John Major government yeah. feels a bit febrile. And this is why he's so desperate to get Rwanda through, because he's put so much credibility yeah, but on it. Would, would it not then be equally ridiculous, though, if he did? Because it wouldn't make any difference to his likelihood of winning at the it's polls. It's going to make yeah. zero difference. It it's no not difference. going to shift him in the polls. No one out there is saying, oh, well, if, if one flight takes off right. in May, or maybe June now. Right. And also, Mike, on a more serious note, I think there should be a public inquiry about this. I know we talk about a lot of government wastage and things. Apparently the cost is up to like 370 yeah. million. I think it is disgusting and scandalous and I don't have the words for how awful it is that we have wasted this mm. much money on possibly deporting 150 people, possibly a few more hundred, whatever it ends up being. Mm. The cost will have been absolutely ludicrous. Yes, and like a lot of these scandals, an awful lot of people are getting very wealthy as a result. You know, not least quite a few Tory donors. Government not lawyers. Least, uh, the people that run Serco. Not least government contractors. Not least, you know, um, the, the people but, traffickers. I mean, everyone's getting rich on this business, well, apart the, from us. Yeah, there's the people who run, like, Bibby Stockholm, or yeah. they've got the contracts, or they've got, um, you know, they're building the accommodation in these l l yeah. large camps, wherever they are, they're turning these RF bases around. Yeah. So, pe so people are making... I think the government, what they're trying to do, they, you know, there's big numbers, 370-odd million they've spent so far. It is a huge, huge amount. Yeah. However, they think if this Rwanda policy acts as a deterrent, it'll bring down the overall bill of the hotels. Yeah, but it will though, will it? Not, and it's not because... acting as a deterrent because they're not idiots. People traffickers can see that we're in utter disarray yeah. over this. I mean, it's just... I mean, only last week we were saying that they were going to offer them three grand to go to Rwanda voluntarily. Voluntarily. You know, which is actually an intrinsic kind of invitation to come here, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's not like, come here and you'll be threatened with being sent to Rwanda. It's like, come here and we'll send you there and pay you three grand And at the same time, as we send over maybe 30 will go, we also have to take people back from yeah, yeah. Rwanda. Right. The whole business of immigration... This is money. But let me ask you, Mike, the whole business of immigration is knackered in this country. What are Labour going to do? We've got Rachel Reeves speaking tonight about how she's going to turn herself into Margaret Thatcher uh, and uh, presumably just upset lots of people in the Labour Party by saying <laughs> that. Momentum, but basically, yeah. you know, we know that she's not Margaret Thatcher. We know that she's not uh, necessarily going to do anything to change pretty much what is government policy and Treasury policy right now. But what would they do on immigration? If I was Yvette Cooper, day one, it's, commission, it's having a royal commission into the whole immigration system, not just looking at what happened what's with Miranda. The whole point is we need a route to stem root and branch review of the whole thing. It's not just looking at asylum policy and things, it's not just looking at immigration, it's looking at the whole round and how it operates. And because dismantling the, moment, the Home Office and well, starting again. Well, it doesn't take again. long to do an investigation into how useless the Home Office is, it's just useless. Yes, we yeah. need to look at how it's operating, what the outcomes are, are we getting the people in for the professions that we need, how do we transition to more domestic... But that would just take ages, wouldn't it? That would but just be months, months and months. If we get it months, right, months, though, yeah. we meant to have sorted this with Brexit, we didn't, let's try and get it right now. If, if immigration's at a record harm, we want to bring it down, we have to look at what the system is doing doing what the outputs are and where the points of pressure are. It doesn't matter what Rachel Weave said in her stupid Mays speech tonight. Because we'll hear a bit of it later on, just so oh, good. Well, about that. The, the Mays speech that I've yeah. never heard of. Um, because they can't lose. I mean, literally, she could stand well, up... Listen, and... if Keir Starmer's still in charge, they can lose. Trust me. Yeah, you know, they can lose. You know, he is okay. not a shoo-in. The anyone. Conservatives and Reform together would have to pull an so absolute... Labour winning is not a no... Labour, Labour winning elections is very much a novelty, you know. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to vote for anyone. Yeah.
But I think that Labour are pretty much shoo a, a shoe in for yeah. the next election. I mean, you know um, about cephology, Ryan. I mean, um, at what point would this be the lowest turnout in a general election? I mean, I don't know whether there have been historically very low turnouts. I, I'm trying to think election. what it would be now. I think if it got down to sort of the sort of into the into the 50s yeah. or uh, early 60s. I just I wonder if that might be yeah, the, the a, thing that saved a low the point. It was 55 percent in yeah. 2001 when yeah. Blair was pretty much a shoe. No, but it won't yeah. save the Tories because Tories aren't going to aren't going to vote. Whereas at least Labour people are going to turn out and vote. No, but got, will it save them from being wiped out is, I suppose, what I'm saying. It po possibly, but you look at their core vote. That core vote for the Conservative Party was always around 30%. You're now going down to sort of mid-20s. Yeah. I mean, are they going to get enough people out to actually save... You know, they could be left with a real rump of about, mm. you know, 100, 150 seats. We had that um, poll that out the other day in the Mail on Sunday saying Labour could get a majority of yeah. 250 seats. Yep. This is far beyond what yeah. Rishi, Rishi Sunak can save. The only hope is that by shining a light on... Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves during the um, the election campaign that you pull some of it back, but we're talking maybe a few dozen seats here yeah. or there. Yeah, well, let's see. I don't know if we could get a flavour of what Rachel Reeves said uh, tonight. Um, we'll have a look at it in a moment. But, I mean, the thing that I think will happen if the Labour Party win a massive majority is that they will all start getting sort of power crazed and the whole party will suddenly start rowing as the Tories have been rowing. Because if you look at how many factions there are inside Labour right now, you know, they can't even agree on what to do about Gaza. You know, David Lammy was up again today shouting and screaming about an, a humanitarian ceasefire, you know, not bothering to mention that Hamas keeps nicking all the, the aid that goes in, you know, but there's plenty of people who don't think he's going far enough. Let's have a look at uh, Rachel Reeves and see if we can be inspired by anything she said. I suggest that the answer to today is an economic approach which recognises how our world has changed. Building growth on strong and secure foundations with active government guided by three imperatives. First, guaranteeing stability. Second, stimulating investment through partnership with business. And third, reform to unlock the contribution of working people and the untapped potential throughout our economy. Uh, as George Galloway would say, I hope you didn't rehearse that speech. I mean, is that the best of it, you know? I, I, think, I think they're... Partnership with business for investment. Wow. Brilliant. Fantastic. I think they're, gonna, they're just going to have to put some more flesh on the bone mm. when, it, when it yeah. comes to that election. They, 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 well, I think what the thing is about this speech is a very sort of broad brush approach. It's not looking at the detail. There's no real tax... There's nothing on, on sort of tax and spend there's nothing, in terms of the it? detail. That's because they're trying, they're trying to hold back and, you know, they, they, they are trying to work on growth, but it's how you actually get there. Yeah. It's all very well... The Conservatives and Labour talking about productivity, growth, these key phrases, but actually having a road, road roadmap to actually yeah. getting there but is very difficult. this is what difficult. I mean. If they get in with a big majority, um, you know, there will be people knocking on the door of her chancellor, uh, Chancellor's office going, this is what we need money for, this is what we need money well, for. Conversely, a big and majority means they could ignore the lunatics inside the party. It's a smaller majority you actually had to worry more about because the Socialist Campaign Group makes up roughly 40 of the Labour MPs mm. at the moment, about a fifth of the parliamentary yeah. party. And if you have a majority in, say, 40 seats or less, suddenly they have a lot more influence over whether Labour's budgets get through, its speeches get through. Right. So actually a bigger majority could actually put them in more of a secure right. position. Also, let's not forget, since Rochdale, we haven't really talked that much about the effect that similar sort of campaigns to George Galloway's could have um, in, you know, in those particular constituencies where there happens to be a big Muslim majority of people. Yeah, there's that. And also, I think you'll have, like, the Green Party in particular could take a lot of votes from Labour. They will be campaigning in particularly sort of student areas, yeah. those metropolitan areas, and saying, look at Labour. They didn't, you know, go through with their £28 billion right. green jobs plan. We'll have right. some of your votes. You and also, the Gaza thing is, like a big, that. is a big number as well, as it is in America with Joe Biden. You know, Joe Biden is getting hammered by the young uh, university students who would normally vote Democrat and who would normally vote for him because they're uh, in their 20s, because they don't like his um, attitude on Gaza. And they don't like US policy on Gaza. And that could still be an issue here. Yeah, I, I, again, but I, I still think it's probably only going to cost you a, a few seats here or there. Again, with the green thing, it's probably only going to cost you that much. I think if they can go for the centre ground, um, and this is what they're doing, they're tending, tending to match the Conservatives on, on, on spending mm -hmm. and their sort of fiscal rules. And I think if they do that, the majority, a lot of the country will think, well... They're, and that was they're, what Reeves yeah. did say tonight. Yeah. She committed to having debt falling at the end of the mm. parliament, which is a huge constraint on public spending. So big strokes, we're not going to see a spending push if she's in the Treasury, which for Labour generates a bigger thing. She either has to get the economy growing and keep public spending as it is, with the NHS welfare, everything is social care at breaking point, 
that's a huge challenge for a party that's traditionally been the party of public services in this yeah. country. And well, that's the problem. Not, for for yeah. everything that everyone says about, you know, the NHS and the lack of funding for public uh, services and local councils, you know, the government has never been bigger. I can't remember a bigger that's government in my entire yeah. career. Well, then uh, you, and, and in fact, my life. Yeah, then you've got the unions. Um, Unite came out tonight yeah. and said that the plan, they need, you need to sort of take off the shackles when it comes to spending and reform. Yeah. You know, saying they're the, some of the policies in the, in, the, in the speech or some of the ideas are for the birds. Mm. So... You've got the unions who will be not, who again will be knocking on the door yeah. asking for and more so money. And so far, the only real magic money tree has been the non dom thing, hasn't it? Isn't, isn't that uh, the, the, the only the, 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 which the Conservatives, that a few times which the Conservatives have taken away? Taken and away. also, you've got the uh, the VAT on, on private school fees, or, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that which is only going to raise 1.7, maybe two billion pounds. Yeah. So, it's not massive. That in won't the keep you in illegal migrants for more than about what a couple of months, ten, 10 minutes, I don't you think, know, yeah. exactly right. And also, um, they're actually attacking something that many people who might vote Labour as a sort of Blairite Labour um, would be sending their kids to those schools. And look, those, that private school thing is a, is a red herring because it could end up costing them a lot more when, you know, everybody then migrates to the state well, school system and exactly puts right. massive pressure on the yeah. state school system. So. And plenty of educationalists will say it also, in, in a way, um, undermines the plan to get everybody into a decent school because yeah. what you'll get is, is the people who can't now afford to put their kids into private school putting their kids into decent secondary Basically, schools, and yeah. the poorer kids won't have the chance. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, it's not very Labour to play for. Not very Labour at all. Mind you, that's what, how they have to be to get in, isn't it? Of course, all, they're doing a Tony Blair, Blair and tacking to the centre. Yeah. You know, it makes you harken back to the good old days of Tony Blair, a man with principles <sighs> compared to what they've got now. But also on the schools, you've got the catchment area. So if you've these people, uh, you know, who can afford school fees, you can say, well, actually, this I can save a hell of a lot yeah. of money. We'll buy a, a nice house yeah. in the catchment area and then push exactly the people right. who uh, are... That's you know, exactly what happened. I feel like you're looking at me. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what will happen. But anyway, listen, guys, good start. We'll get you back to talk about a great many other things, of course. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. After the break, we look at the tablecloth that has been pulled from under the feet of the eco nutters. Don't go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to abandon and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, finally, some common sense as the Court of Appeal has banned the excuse that fear of the climate crisis is a legitimate belief. Yes, in a blow to the woke ecomaniacs everywhere, this last line of defence that has got them all off jail time and time again has now been confined to the history books. Joining me live right now is former commander of specialist operations, Mr. Roy Ram. Roy, very good evening to you. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, some of these eco-nutters have been uh, just literally taking the mickey out of the police, out of the law, uh, out of the judicial system for ages and ages and ages. We saw them time and time again, uh, you know, getting pulled off the M25, being taken to the police station, being released and then going straight back to the M25. So is this as significant uh, a, a, a manoeuvre and a decision as I'd like to think it is? Yeah, it's, it's very important, Mike. Um, you know, and credit to the Attorney General for, for looking at it following the acquittal um, of demonstrators who sort of said, well, you know, if you'd known how important the issue was that caused me to chuck paint all over your premises, you'd have been OK with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was an absurd decision at, at that court level. So when the AG took it to the uh, to the, the Court of Appeal, and, and we've got this judgment now, which which is, as you rightly said, I mean, it's just common sense. You checked, cannot have give protesters this absurd license where they say, well, you, you know, I, I've damaged your building by chucking paint over it or I've um, slashed your paintings in a gallery um, because, you, you know what, I've got this very strong political or philosophical belief yeah. that, that, that kind of legitimises my actions. You, I mean, you know, I, I think it, it doesn't need a lawyer to see how stupid it was. Well, exactly right. You might as well start robbing banks and saying, you know, I've got a sort of, you know, uh, a thing against capitalism, so that means that I can rob banks with impunity and I can get off with it. Yeah, I, I, do you know, I, I met a few robbers uh, in my time and <laughs> the redistribution of wealth as a philosophical um, defence was not one that was ever raised, but uh, <laughs> the spectre of it is quite fearful. But, I mean, you know, getting back to the point of the day, we have to see proper judgments closing down some of these activities which cause enormous distress to most of the public and cause damage to property. It's, mm. just, it's just not acceptable. No, and also because, of course, we've heard from them recently that they're going to have different tactics this year. The Just of All Brigade, um, only what last month said, uh, they're going to start protesting outside people's homes. We've seen a couple of them being arrested for delivering letters to individual homes of individual MPs. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, I know they say, oh, we're only doing what the postman does. That's intimidatory behaviour. If you're a politician and you've got people turning up outside your house where your family live, I don't think that's acceptable. No, I think that's right. And, and you know, you have to look at the wider context of it. OK, people, people go into politics and I think, you know, a thick skin is something that's required. But everybody's entitled to a home life and to enjoy quiet, the quiet enjoyment of their homes. And, you know, people, MPs like, like all of us, got wives, families, husbands um, and children. And it's not right to focus on their personal lives for what's going on in their professional life. Westminster is the place to lobby, all right, you know, ask to go and see them in their constituency offices. But I think that, you know, private addresses should absolutely be, uh, you know, off the radar. Mm. Well, as I say, um, it was only, I think, last week that one of those Just Stop Oil regulars, Phoebe, somebody or other, um, who comes from a very posh family and went to a £41,000 million pound, well, 41, pound a year um, a, a state, uh, sorry, sponsored private school, um, she was arrested for taking a letter to Emily Thornberry's house. But today, and I think we've got a little bit of footage of this, more of them uh, then went and attacked Emily Thornberry uh, at a public meeting that she was at. I think we can have a look at it. I'm very 
as it should, in 2020, Emily Thornbury uh, said that we have no time for cowardice in the face of the climate crisis. And yet, uh, at this crucial historic moment, uh, Labour are rolling back their commitments uh, to the climate. Uh, we need Labour to be brave, to not be cowardly at this moment. We need you to make a commitment at this moment to revoke the Tory licenses for new oil and gas infrastructure that will lock us on to the worst pathways of global warming and climate catastrophe. So there we are, and yet another e exhibition of complete and utter tomfoolery. And basically, these two characters have just stopped oil. Uh, now they're throwing orange confetti because it's slightly better than throwing paint, I suppose. But they're disrupting a meeting. Uh, nobody really wants them there. Uh, and they're basically demanding that Emily Thornberry cancels um, her membership of the Labour Party and commits to leaving it uh, because they're not going to cancel Tory oil and gas um, licences that have been put out. But you'll love this one, um, Roy, because guess what their names are? Casper and Genevieve. Right. Well, you know, Casper and Genevieve, uh, I think what they do at events, when they behave like that, you know, at public events, they risk generating a backlash from people who are there to listen to legitimate arguments. Uh, and it's the kind of behaviour that it invites challenge and, in, and invites them getting thrown out, perhaps, you know, not necessarily by the conference organisers, but other people that are there. And, and it's just, it's inviting disorder. And I think, you know, it kind of undermines the strength of their arguments. Mm. And I don't think they see that. Right. And do you think this might change now the way perhaps that the police operate when they're trying to, to, to deal with these guys? Because we know that they were given sort of better powers towards the back end of last year to police their demonstrations. And when they were trying to walk slowly, the police seemed to be getting a bit better at dealing with them. Will this help the police, you think? Yeah, I think it will. Uh, you, you know, I think we police by consent. That's, that's been something that's been around since 1839. But, you, you know, it's the consent of the broader mm. public and I think that the consent of the broader public was undermined. It was being it was being lost because the police were seen to have been too soft, yeah. uh, not forceful enough. And, and I think you will see a more robust, more direct police activity over this coming summer. Yeah. And if that gives them the opportunity to be more robust and it gives them the sort of licence, if you like, and, and permission, uh, if you like, to do that, I think a lot of people will have their faith restored in the police. I think you're right. Uh, you know, I think that when you go into central London, I, I went in a few times during various protests um, to see other events or to, you know, go to the to theatre or whatever, mm. and, and to see the streets being taken over in the way that they were and yeah. the kind of activity that was going on and was being ignored or tolerated. It was quite upsetting, actually, to see London in that state. And I think that mm. ordinary people who want to go do their shopping in Oxford Street, go to the parks, go, go about their business, don't want to see it continually disrupted week in, week out by these kinds of protests. Yeah, exactly right. Because the fact is, is that the rules of engagement um, are not really fit for purpose now. Because if you have, for example, one of these Palestinian marches every single Saturday for 24 weeks, as we have just had, you know, that is not the same as an ordinary protest that would happen once in a while or once a year or, you know, on May Day or something like that. You know, so we need to have, surely, a better way of dealing with those kinds of events. Well, I think you need that for a number of reasons, uh, not least of which is the abstraction of police staff. Uh, you know, we've seen this week that I think it's 60 detectives are, are being taken off of murder squads to to save money, to to save, uh, to try and get the Met to to save money, to to save, uh, to try and get the Met to meet its budget. Spent over thirty million pounds policing these demonstrations, mm. and that impacts on every community in London. You know where you should have police officers out investigating major crime, investigating burglaries, giving public reassurance. They're spending all weekend walking around central London, and, uh, and ironically, um, you know when you look at something like the reduction uh, of the, of police officers on murder squads, the people that will be out there calling for justice for victims are very much 
a lot of them, the same people that are out there demonstrating and taking police resource away mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, exactly right. Roy, good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Roy Ram there uh, telling us his uh, ideas of why the police should be able to be more empowered now by this particular scenario. He's a former commander of specialist operations at the police, of course. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Next up, we're going to look at Labour's lecture of little content and Starmer's ULES U-turn. Stay exactly where you are. Thank you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> even, <laughs> for, yeah. even, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved another on from era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. And now, earlier this evening, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves announced that she's entering her Maggie Thatcher era as she promises to go hard on the economy if elected. And that's looking like a strong possibility at the moment, despite Rishi Sunak's best efforts. But can you really trust Labour to deliver a strong and stable economy? Well, I wouldn't be able to give you a yes on that one. But to give her a take on this very question, I'm now joined down the line by former government advisor, uh, Claire Pearsall. Claire, very good evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, I'm not so sure about Rachel Reeves. Um, she talks a good game. She manages to make an entire speech about economic policy without mentioning any actual economic policy. Um, and is Labour really so confident about getting into power that they can even mention the name Margaret Thatcher? 
Well, it does seem as if they're uh, looking at the Conservatives uh, for all of their economic policies uh, going forward. When you think about what it is Rachel Reeves has actually put forward, it is no different to Rishi Sunak when he was Chancellor, um, investments that Margaret Thatcher wanted to make, you know, encouraging businesses to invest, the private sector working alongside government, improving tech skills, which was a big one from Rishi Sunak, and uh, cementing Britain's uh, position as an innovative economy. So all I think she's done is take the really interesting and good parts of what the Conservatives have done over the decades and added a few words, but no specifics to what Labour would actually do different and why it would work differently. Yes. And it seems to me that, you know, with all of these comparisons going on about whether this is like 1979 or whether it's like 1997, you know, Thatcher was able to unleash the power of the sort of financial services industry, which previously didn't exist. She was able to offer, you know, people the ability to buy their own council homes. She was able to offer people shares uh, in, in companies that were publicly owned and all of that. Blair, by contrast, was able to kind of completely change and revolutionise the way we all lived. He brought the digital age to Britain and all of that. You know, I don't see any of those kinds of opportunities for Keir Starmer to suddenly change the way we live. No, and of course, we mustn't forget that one of Labour's big policies was, of course, this green revolution. Mm. Whether you agree with it or not, I they don't. wanted to put <laughs> do I, no, I, I didn't think you did. And I'm with you on this. £28.5 billion was meant to go into the green economy. Well, yeah. what was that coming from? And now they've had to U-turn on it. So their fiscal policy has basically fallen apart over just one pledge. Mm. So I think it's down to about £4.7 billion now. So I think we're starting to see these things eke away. And, of course, there was the great uh, non-DOM tax status, right. which Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, has uh, removed away already. So yes. that also leaves a massive hole of £2.7 billion in uh, Labour spending fees. Yeah, and the other problem they're going to have is the immense amount of money that currently this government's spending uh, on illegal mig migrants coming into to the country. Billions and billions of pounds. It seems to double about every sort of three to six months. I mean, God knows what it's going to be like by the time we get to the end of 2024. Uh, yeah, well, quite interesting. I think it, it will indefinitely increase. Uh, there are no plans realistically from Labour as to what they would do with migration or what they want their policies to look like. And if they do come up with a policy, it hasn't been costed. So I think that we would all be so much worse off, especially if they start looking to open up the borders even further to uh, Palestinians fleeing conflict. Uh, you know, they seem to want to let the world in and have someone else pay for it, which is always the problem you have with the Labour government. Yes. And, of course, I was saying this earlier to the panel that, you know, it's been such a long time since they've been in government. If they do win uh, a big... Uh, majority, which I'm not entirely certain that they will do. Um, by the way, Harry Cole has apparently tweeted out tonight that he thinks the election is going to be on October the 17th. Uh, we'll see about that. But I wonder whether they've actually got the uh, the cojones or, or the kind of stamina to set up a government because they'll be so thrilled to be in there. They'll be so amazed that they've got a majority. There'll be so many factions of the party fighting with each other for who gets what and how much money can the Treasury give for all their pet projects. I think it'll be chaos. Well, it will. And that, that's always the difficult lesson that opposition parties have to learn. When you get into government, you have to make some real and hard choices. So all of the things that you've promised throughout your election campaign, you suddenly have to be responsible for. Mm. And as we've seen from Keir Starmer, he's not very keen on making an actual decision and sticking to it. And when you're running the country, you have to. You have to sometimes be unpopular. You have problems within your own party that you've got to battle. And then you'll have a very, very noisy opposition who are looking to, to pick holes in anything that you come forward with. Right. And, I mean, you've been a government advisor. You've been behind the, the curtain, if you like. I mean, what is it going to be like in there at the moment? Because we see uh, Rishi Sunak kind of stumbling from day to day. I mean, I started my show yesterday in which I, I actually said, you know, Rishi Sunak survives another day because it feels like every day is another miracle. You know, it must be pretty down, uh, down sort of trodden in, inside of Downing Street and inside of any government department where you've got special advisors trying to cheer everybody up. Yeah, I mean, it will be really difficult. Most departments are going to be under enormous pressure. Um, I've been out of a government department for a, for a little bit of time, but I work in Westminster. I was there today and the mood just feels really flat, Yeah, uh, especially Conservative MPs who are wandering around thinking, 
why isn't this getting any better? This is just incredibly hard work and wanting to concentrate on winning their own seat. But every single time they want to go out and talk to their constituents, there seems to be another problem yeah. coming straight at them. So it is incredibly miserable at the moment. I should imagine that in departments, there is enormous standoffs between civil servants and special advisors and ministers because we don't know how long this parliament is going to go on for. So there really isn't going to be massive decisions made on spending. No, exactly right. And I mean, that is the thing, isn't it? In terms of the way that the, the future is, is going to be for the Tory party, a lot of people are saying to me, well, let's see what happens uh, at the local elections in May. If it's really bad for Rishi Sunak, that's when the proper plotting will really begin. But Madeleine Grant said to me from The Telegraph yesterday, um, you know, where is the low point? Because every time you think you've reached it, it gets even lower. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's been the problem. Just when you think you've heard the most crazy idea or the most crazy conspiracy going around, uh, out comes another one. Mm. And we've seen it over the weekend. And it just seems to be this endless round of uh, decisions that are put out, communications that fall flat, leaving a vacuum for everybody to fill. So once you, you don't have a sort of proper comment coming out from number 10, a really concrete decision on what's going to happen and what they actually mean then it just gets into a real mess. And all you see are plotters sitting there working out how best they can position themselves, how best they can leak things to newspapers to make things even more difficult mm. when they need to actually be coming together and working as a team because the real enemy is the opposition and that's who we have to be. Yes, exactly right. And still talking of that front bench of the Labour Party, I still think there's an awful lot of people in this country who couldn't name you more than about three people sitting there. They could probably tell you who Keir Starmer is. They probably know who Angela Rayner is. They might even know David Lammy, but that's about it, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, I think they'll probably recognise a few faces. They may not be able to put names to them, but it, that will change. It is a bit natural when you've got mm. uh, you've had an opposition there for, for 14 years that's chopped and changed and hasn't said anything very interesting. The only reason that uh, opposition benches come to your attention is normally when there's been a problem or a little local difficulty yes. being brought up in the newspaper. So I don't think that's unusual. They will have to set out their stall come the election campaign, which is what all MPs do anyway. Absolutely. Claire, good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. I'm sure there's much more fun to be had uh, over the course of the next few weeks. And if Harry Cole's right, and it is October the 17th, uh, you better start strapping yourselves in uh, because it's going to be a very bumpy ride, I'll tell you that. Uh, you're watching The Independent Republican, Mike Graham. After the break, we'll look at the disgrace of Britain's roads, why councils as well want to fine you for driving on them. Heaven forbid. It's all coming next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for Taking the Mic. Beware the Ides of March. It officially falls on March the 15th, so last Friday, actually. And it is traditionally the date in the Roman calendar that is associated with misfortune and doom. Now, what does that remind you of? Ah, oh, yes, you've got it. The climate change nutters. And believe it or not, they're at it again. Not for them any good news this week. Not for the eco-nuts, a recognition that people in this country and around the world have been shoehorned into life-changing practices and expenditure, all because they've told us we must deal with the climate emergency. But guess what? Apparently, it has all been in vain. All those electric cars, the heat pumps, the low-traffic neighbourhoods, the sustainable energy sources, the windmills, the low-emission zones, and even the veganism, all worthless, pointless and utterly clueless. The World Meteorological Society, yeah, I didn't know it existed either. Apparently, it's the United Nations Agency which does for the Green Brigade what the World Health Organization does for disease, i.e. doesn't stop it spreading, has warned today that we must sound a red alert about global warming. They say there are records being smashed all over the planet. Increases in greenhouse gases, increases in land and water temperatures, and the melting of sea ice and glaciers. The WMO reckons that the world is failing to stop the planet warming up by one and a half degrees Celsius. And even UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is joining in. He said, the Earth's issuing a distress call. The latest state of the global climate report shows a planet on the brink. Well, we've been on the brink for bloody 50 years now, haven't we? Remember the greenhouse effect? Remember all those sprays that you couldn't use? So here we go again. The answer, of course, aside from more demands for us to spend more public money on yet more green policies, is to have, you guessed it, yet another climate conference. This one is in Denmark on Thursday and Friday, so look out for more private jets delivering climate experts and government ministers to Copenhagen. Meanwhile, back home, the Green Brigade here are at it as well. There's a thing called the Green Alliance, which is an eco-think tank and charity. They're accusing Rishi Sunak of leaving a sorry legacy of delays and cancellations when it comes to the net zero targets. They say, we are simply not doing enough. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? because they keep doing it. But let's have a look at just who backs these organisations. The Green Alliance is partnered with all kinds of foundations and is supported by a whole variety of companies. Included in their funding page are the National Trust, Southern Water, Greenpeace, the University of Sussex, Wessex Water, the Wildlife Trust and the uh, Reform of Social Change. These green nutters are absolutely everywhere, inveigling their way into governments, helping local authorities to punish car drivers, and using their power to influence private company policies. It's sinister, it's far from transparent, and it is just like a cult. But mostly, it's a multi-billion pound business and an awful lot of people are making an awful lot of money. Worst of all, everything we've been made to do to save the planet hasn't worked. So how about we just stop doing it? Fire up the Quattro. Now, speaking of uh, the Green Brigade, Britain's highways are heading for breaking point, according to a new report, with pothole repairs at an eight-year high. According to the Asphalt Industry Alliance, two million potholes are needed to be fixed, up 43% on the previous year. Talk Today correspondent Nick Ellaby has been out and about speaking to locals in one of the worst affected areas, and that's Chesterfield, 
in Derbyshire. Tell me about Chesterfield's potholes. Uh, they're horrific at the moment, I've got to say. Uh, every road you, you drive down, pothole, pothole, pothole after pothole, it's awful. Pretty sure the track in my car is gone because of them. Uh, they need to get sorted, really. Tell me about the potholes in Chesterfield. Uh, the, just a genuine nightmare. There's, like, every single road has got potholes on. They're tyre eaters, they're alloy wheel killers. Uh, yeah, and they're just absolutely everywhere. And have you had any damage to your car or anyone you know? Yeah, actually, um, I work as part of the NHS and one of the doctors had to call in once because he basically uh, ruined all wishbones on his car and suspension, basically just ripped the entire, the entire lot out. Have you or anyone you know damaged their car because of them? Yeah, yeah, I know someone at work, she's uh, gone through one and it's just punctured a tyre. She's had to write it to council and stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a flat tyre last week. From the pole? Yeah, from the pole. Are they being no. fixed? No, no, I've reported it multiple times to the council and they've just done nothing. Uh, my family have tried reporting it and you just can't get through. That'll be because they're all working from home. It comes as councils launch a new war on motorists with dozens applying for the right to issue fines if drivers get caught in yellow boxes. You'd want to hope that some of that money will be put towards fixing the state of the roads, but it's probably unlikely, isn't it? Joining me now, though, uh, is the man himself, Mr Pothole, um, otherwise known as Mark Morrell. Uh, Mark, and uh, very, very good evening. Welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You and I have been talking about potholes for longer than I'd care to remember, um, but it has re it has seems to have reached kind of crisis point with all those people. You barely talk to anybody now who hasn't had some kind of damage to their car done because of a horrendous pothole. Yeah, you're right. That uh, Ashcroft Industries Alliance uh, report today saying that the backlog currently stands at £16.3 billion and worrying that uh, in 15 years' time, 53% of our roads will be structurally failed. So uh, this needs to be a turning point. I mean, unless government actually invest in an annual resurfacing programme, mm. and that needs to be a multi-billion pound year on year like other countries, you know, uh, then we're going to end at a very sorry state. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's horrendous. I mean, yeah, Chesterfield, I get quite a few things in Derbyshire and around Chesterfield through my uh, social media feeds. Um, and, you know, the actual backlog got worse mm. by £2.2 .2 billion pound in 12 months. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? And tell us, because you're the expert here, exactly who is responsible for fixing potholes, because it might vary depending on where you are, right? Yeah, local authorities generally for your local roads um, and the motorways and national trunk roads are national highways. Now, this report only covers local roads. Um, I've never seen the motorways and trunk roads in the condition they are. Um, I had people sending me pictures of uh, the M20 the other day mm. with uh, puddles on. I mean, you know, if someone comes into the UK and they come onto a road, so I had a, a German guy contact me and said he was it was horrendous coming into the country. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly anyone who drives in uh, continental Europe will say that uh, the roads in every other country apart from this one are so much better than ours. But, of course, if you go to Spain, a lot of their roads were built by EU money, uh, which we contributed to, and apparently we were too rich of a country to get any of that EU money, so our roads are now worse than Spain's. <laughs> Yeah, we're 37th in the world. The last one that was done in uh, uh, assessment was done in 2019, prior to the pandemic, for a G7 nation. Places like Cyprus are above us. Yeah, Cyprus, the roads are absolutely fantastic. I would say one or two things to you um, at this point, Mark. You know, clearly um, there's more vehicles on the roads than ever before because people are taking to the roads more often than not because it's now the cheapest form of travel, despite the fact that, you know, it's more and more expensive to drive. It's still cheaper than, say, taking four people on a train journey somewhere, you know, where you end up costing the family an absolute fortune. Also, I wonder how much of an effect very, very much heavier vehicles are having. And I'm talking, of course, about electric vehicles, electric buses, electric lorries, electric vans, electric cars. They are very, very heavy. And I wonder how much of this damage is being caused because the, the, those vehicles are so heavy. Yeah, it doesn't help. And also, you get the initial load from an electric motor through the wheels. It puts more stresses on the highway. Now, when you've got highways that have been neglected for decades that are cracking and crazy in them, <clears throat> it doesn't take a lot for the mm. rain to get in there. And then them vehicles passing over, and they cause like a hydrostatic pressure, so like a wedge being driven in, into them, and they have the vehicle more so. Um, but it's a perfect storm. It's just been decades of underinvestment. It's not just the current government. It's previous governments. They've been ignored, ignored, ignored. Um, now it's come to a point where, you know, we've got an election coming up 
Uh, I think everybody really needs to voice the situation to whoever wants their vote, whether it be local elections or national election, to say that as road users, we pay in over £50 billion a year into various taxation uh, to, on our roads, and government currently only right. give £1.2 billion. And you'll get the Department of Transport to say we're, doing a, uh, we're going to give an extra £8.3 billion over 11 years. That's enough to do 5,000 miles of road resurfacing. Let's put that in context. That's two and a half percent of the road network in England and Wales. Yeah. Currently, 20 percent of our roads need resurfacing and major works. And as we know, you know, by we get in 15 years' time, it'd be 53 per, uh, percent. And the and the, it, you know, you'd be talking sort of up to 100 billion pounds. Mm. Yeah, exactly right. And so there really should be some amount of money ring fenced, shouldn't there, by local authorities, either whether it be from council tax or whether it be from the amount of money they get from central government that they must spend on fixing these things. Because presumably the other problem we've got is that depending on which part of the country you're in, some of them get fixed better than others. Yeah, I mean, the quality of repairs is uh, an issue. Um, there is some not very good machinery like that Pothole Pro from JCB that it, it drives better uh, repairs. But I think we need to change the whole system because at the moment, you know, if we talk about road tax, well, that also goes into the central exchequer. Other countries have a road tax and the money spent on the roads. Mm. I mean, we need to change things. Doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different result is madness, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I think we need to change the whole concept. 80% of it's about funding. The rest of it's about management, quality right. control, better materials, better training. Uh, the whole thing needs to be changed and the culture needs to be changed. Yes. And I was talking to a friend of mine who lives in uh, one of the southeast counties who said that his local high street was dug up recently and there's a contract that exists between the people doing the digging and the people kind of doing the coning off of the, of the work, if you like. And if the people doing the digging stop earlier in the day, the people who are blocking the road with all the cones and the fences and everything else, they don't get paid a full day's work unless they stay there for the full day. So they keep the fences up even though the actual work is finished, which causes all manner of disruption and, and traffic jams. But also, when they took the, uh, the stuff away, uh, the hole wasn't properly filled in. Yeah, I mean, utilities works. In the past, when um, councils had uh, some more resources in there, they, they could police them. Uh, because councils have cut successively on staff numbers, it means that the roads and uh, the assets actually um, failing. I mean, there, there's, you can find utilities, but you've got to catch them out. You've got to have a situation where uh, you've got to be proactive. Yes, you might have to spend a little money in the first place, but there's revenues councils can get from finding uh, utilities that underperform. Yeah. Absolutely right. Mark Morell, good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, also known, of course, as Mr Pothole. Um, the problem gets worse and worse and worse. As I said, me and Mark have been talking about this for a very, very long time. And the pothole problem has always been very high uh, in the minds of everybody who drives. Because if you've got insurance on your car, your insurance will go up if you hit a pothole and it needs repairing. And if you have got insurance on your car, some of it will not cover an accident caused by you hitting a pothole. So it's an absolute nightmare. And we'll be talking, I'm sure, lots more about it because the Tory party are trying to tell us that they know that this is a problem for people and they're going to be helping them out. Really? Are they? Is it just another pipe dream? We shall see. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. At nine o'clock, we're going to look at the lunacy of all of those Kate conspiracies and Donald Trump is threatening to boot Prince Harry out of the USA. Please, God, don't send him back here. Let him stay where he is and you stay where you are as well. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey. Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, uh, miss you. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening, and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online, and of course, we're on your smart speaker as well. Coming up. Breaking news, bosses at the hospital where Princess Kate had her operation are investigating a confidentiality breach. We'll bring you all those details very shortly. Plus, Donald Trump says Prince Harry should be deported over his past drug use. And the BBC plans to feature adverts in its radio output for the first time ever to rival its competitor stations. And now for the story at the top of the least surprising news of the week department. Motorists are getting rinsed by local councils for minor traffic offences that are costing us millions. More than 10 million households now live in areas where councils have been given powers to hand out penalties to motorists as high as £105 a time. And we're not just talking about parking fines handed out by overzealous jobsworths who willingly spend each and every day making people's lives miserable. No, no, this is much worse because this means that traffic infractiones, which used to be the sole purview of the police, now become under the authority of your local council. And you know how they love a bit of authority. We're talking about fines for getting caught in a yellow box, making illegal U-turns, driving in a bus lane, making banned left or right turns, and going the wrong way up a one-way street. What's the problem, I hear you cry? If it's illegal, you should get a fine. Well, that would be OK if, in fact, you knew it was illegal. Just to explain, I've got fines for almost all of the above while driving in London where local councils have had this right since 2003. And each time, I had no idea I was committing any offence. And that's not just because I'm a complete and utter idiot. When I was done for driving the wrong way up an unfamiliar street, I challenged the fine because the no-entry sign was so high up on a pole that it wasn't possible to see it. They refused my appeal, but the following week I went back to check and they'd lowered the sign to make it more visible by about six feet. And when I was fined for venturing into a yellow box for just a few seconds, just before an amber light turned green, because there was nowhere else to go other than to block a roundabout, I didn't bother repealing because sometimes it's easier just to pay the fine. And when I was fined for driving in a bus lane, my appeal that it was impossible to know it was a 50-yard long new bus lane while driving behind a bus, because there was only a sign on the surface of the road which is not visible to me, it was declined. The newly designed road was so confusing and it was no excuse, apparently, even though they had built a wide pavement divider which was previously not there. And when I was fined for making an illegal right turn in the West End, 
where the sign was barely visible in a busy street where signage was so confusing that there was about 50 signs on one pole, once again, my appeal was rejected. The roads in our cities now are so badly designed that most people who commit offences do so by accident. But there's rarely any forgiveness offered. 85 of England's 152 highway authorities now have this power, and you know what they're going to do. They'll buy more cameras and fine everyone more, because it's easy. More than 27 million potential drivers live in these areas. That's 59% of the population aged 16 and over. The trouble is, they hold all the cards. You'd better be prepared to fork out a few hundred quid a year, because they're coming for you. Now, later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Metro newspaper. And they're going with a very unusual story, which we will pick up a little bit more from on uh, the panel when the panel get back in. And it's basically the headline that says this. First, cyber flasher jail. This is a ghastly individual called Nicholas Hawkes, a sex offender who sent naked images of himself to a 15-year-old girl and a woman who's aged 60. Um, and he's basically become the first person in Britain to be convicted of cyber flashing. Um, he sent the unsolicited photos from his phone. He was caught. He was tracked down. He was tried. And now he's going to have to go to jail. Um, so that's a warning to anyone that would ever, ever get involved in anything like that. We'll bring you more, as I say, on that throughout the show. And also much later on when the panel returns, we'll have a lot more from the front pages and the other newspapers as well. Now, there's a breaking story that I want to bring you on Catherine Princess of Wales. It's been brought to us as an exclusive from the Mirror newspaper. It turns out that there's an investigation currently underway uh, because while Kate, Princess of Wales, was a patient in the London clinic in January, at least one member of staff is said to have been caught trying to access her notes. And, of course, bosses have launched a, launched a probe into these claims because... Breaching confidentiality is a very, very serious problem. And when she was in the London clinic, at least one member of staff was said to have tried to get a hold of them. The allegations have sent shockwaves through the hospital, which is in Marylebone in central London. It's got a very, very good reputation for discreetly treating members of the royal family, former presidents, prime ministers and various other celebrities. One insider says this is a major security breach and incredibly damaging for the hospital. Um, and it's got a reputation for treating members of the royal family. Um, we don't yet know whether the police have been involved and the police have been told but this is a story exclusively being reported uh, in the Daily Mirror. We'll bring you more on that when we get it. But let's speak, first of all, to host of To Die For Daily Podcast, Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, you know, we were shown yesterday the first pictures of, uh, of William and Kate out shopping together. Um, we'll get to those in a moment. First, let's talk about this incredible breaking news about this possible breach of confidentiality in what you might call the top people's clinic in London. Mike, you and I have been concerned about this for the last two or three weeks. We have specifically said that the chaos that's been generated online could ultimately jeopardize the Princess of Wales's safety, her, you know, confidentiality right here. Mm. You're seeing somebody that has breached protocol um, for what? Social media clout? Uh, and I'm doing some research on my end because this is a breaking story. But what I can tell you is following some of the fallout online over the Princess of Wales and um, her health and the photo. There is a blogger that is located in Southern California. She has over a million followers on Instagram. Um, she became popular through the Johnny Depp trial uh, and has slowly eased her way into royal commentary and she there were claims on her social media that she had a contact within the hospital that gave her information about the princess of wales's health and on her instagram i watched her apologize to the princess of wales um, because of this information she claims to have received from a member of staff at the hospital so a part of me wonders if You've got over a million followers. That is a huge draw. Yeah. Could that announcement, could could that social media activity have led to this investigation? I don't know. Mm. But as far as we know, through what's been reported so far, is someone only attempted to access those documents. There's no report so far that someone successfully accessed those documents about the Princess of Wales's private uh, health concerns at this hospital. And it's like you said, I mean, the, the Kennedys 
were, were clients at this hospital. Yeah. Prince Philip, Princess Margaret, this is typically a very trusted venue for high profile individuals. Uh, if this turns out to be true, what a disappointing experience for the Princess of Wales. Absolutely right. And it is, in fact, a criminal offence for any member of staff um, in an NHS or even a private healthcare hospital to access medical records of a patient. It's not clear whether it's a, a criminal offence to attempt to. I suppose it would depend on the circumstances, but it's possible that it could be a criminal uh, investigation because if you're trying to access something which is illegal, then you are somehow committing a crime by doing so, aren't you? I mean, if I'm trying to rob a bank, I hope that I'm going to jail for trying to rob a bank. So, I mean, I know that that's an extreme in comparison, but I think it's if there's the intention there to break the law, right. surely somebody is going to be uh, reprimanded for for such a, a ridiculous activity. And again, Mike, uh, I just can't stress enough. You and I have been worried about this. Somebody chasing social media clout and doing yes. something unethical in an attempt to to gain that notoriety. And here we are. Yes, exactly right because as we said last night when we were speaking about the whole situation with uh, Kate and the pictures and what happened on Mother's Day and what subsequently happened over the weekend and what subsequently happened uh, in the sun today you know the trolls have still not stopped because I think now the genie is so far out of the bottle it's never going back in and I think there are now people who are so obsessed with this story that no matter what evidence they see they won't believe it yeah, and how much do you want to just tell those people to get a life? I mean, I'm having to bite lot. my tongue here. <laughs> yeah. I know, I'm having to bite my tongue here because I, you know, people are forwarding me these conspiracy videos and I just don't have time for this kind. It just seems so idiotic. I don't have time for this. Um, there's not a big conspiracy. We, They were ridiculously open with us. The transparency at the beginning of this process was, hey, guess what? You are not going to see this woman until Easter. Mm. Uh, for some reason, that just was not a good enough excuse for the weirdos that you've seen cultivate huge audiences online uh, by stirring the pot. I believe that the Princess of Wales um, is in recovery. I think she's doing well. I believe we're going to see her at Easter. And I wish everybody would just leave her the hell alone. Yeah, exactly right. But I did say to you last night, and I mean, I didn't want it to come true, but I said, no doubt there will be people who immediately they see this video will say, oh, that's not her. But in fact, it now has been proven to be uh, a genuine video. Uh, it has been examined by the people that do these kinds of things and they have checked with facial images. They've checked all sorts of uh, antecedents and editing buttons and whether anything was done. And it is a genuine video uh, and it would appear uh, that they, they can prove that it is definitely the two of them together. And it made somebody very, very rich, Mike. I mean, yes. this was the, all of the people complaining about it being a blurry photo. They grabbed a screenshot from a video that was taken. That's why the photo is blurry. This was likely, honestly, not a setup. Otherwise, I think you would have better quality. I think it was somebody creeping inside their car and they realized they hit the jackpot when they saw these two. Um, and uh, I, Andy Cohen here, who is a huge personality, he's basically the head of Bravo created the housewife franchises and probably polluted uh, American television if we want to if we really <laughs> want to give him credit um, but he has said there's no way that's Kate on on Twitter so you're even seeing some of these high profile individuals mm. fall into the conversation and it's just like uh, completely unnecessary get a life right. I mean don't you have a, don't you have some reality trash television to to create over in this in your, in your trash TV corner right Exactly right. Well, we've got a page from The Sun uh, tomorrow morning, ten, page 10. Arthur Edwards, uh, very well-known, very famous royal photographer, has been doing it even longer than I was doing it for. Uh, trolls claim it wasn't Kate, and Elvis has been spotted riding Shergar. You might not know what Shergar is. That was a horse that got kidnapped um, by uh, the IRA and was never found again. Um, and so people have always gone, well, where's Elvis? I mean, this is that kind of level, isn't it? Elvis is still alive. I spotted him in a McDonald's in Salt Lake City. And my, my problem at this point is I don't feel like they should give, I don't feel like William and Catherine should give the public any more than yeah. they initially promised because then the public realizes that they're dictating their behavior and they have a sort of control over these people that are typically unattainable. Yes. And that's what makes them so special and that's where they need to remain unattainable. Yes, exactly right. But that is where, I mean, and, and to be serious for a moment, we can have this serious conversation um, without being disrespectful
people to, to the royal family. You know, they need to be so careful. I was listening to a conversation today about how good the Queen, the late Queen was about all of this, Queen Elizabeth II, how very carefully she was um, um, making sure that whatever was released by the royal family, whatever was said, whatever image was put out, whatever view was expressed, it was always given with a great deal of care. And it seems as though they just might need to get some of that back. I mean, but how much do you feel like the Mother's Day photo was a sharp reaction to trying to silent speculation over the Princess of Wales's health? Because that's my argument. I think, yeah, a lot of strategy has been thrown out the door. Let's just shut everyone up and release a cute photo. In theory, that is a great idea. But when you release a photo that has been um, altered in any, in any way, really, uh, you add additional questions and you fire up the speculation. Uh, so I agree with you. Are they are they trying to be too modern? Are they trying to modernize the royal family too much and it's negatively affecting the magic that typically surrounds the royal family? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. But I dare say the Sun tonight has also got a leader saying, you know, just move on, get on with it, you know, get a life effectively. And I think, I think we would all share uh, in that particular wish Time for everyone to get a grip. Kinsey, thank you very much indeed, as ever. Kinsey Schofield there uh, with her take on the latest rumour, uh, the latest report, I should say, this, uh, this night in the uh, Daily Mirror, uh, which is that there's now an investigation going on at the London Clinic uh, where it is supposedly uh, where uh, somebody tried to access the confidential files, medical files, uh, of Kate, Princess of Wales, while she was in there in January. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, before we discuss the BBC, though, I'd like to introduce the former BBC royal correspondent, Michael Cole. Let me get your reaction, Michael, to that breaking story, um, an extraordinary story that the London Clinic uh, is currently investigating, the possibility that somebody uh, in that building, in that uh, uh, place, actually tried to access confidential records of the Princess of Wales. What do you make of it? Well, if that happened, it was a felony, it was vile, and it was despicable. But if we throw our minds back, Michael, to uh, before Prince George was born, when uh, Princess Kate, who was then the Duchess of Cambridge, was in another hospital nearby, the Edward VII Hospital, uh, with severe morning sickness, a couple of jokers, uh, so-called, on a Australian radio station rang the hospital pretending to be, I think, Buckingham Palace, and they were put through to a hapless nurse, a conscientious nurse, who thought she was doing her duty, and she spoke about her patient. And um, she wasn't uh, a native speaker, she was an overseas uh, person who'd come here to work. And she was highly embarrassed because she did give away some information about their very famous patient. So this sort of thing goes on. That was just malicious stupidity, but this is probably uh, criminal intent mm. uh, with a view to presumably making money. So uh, the London Clinic is probably the most prestigious hospital in this country. In, in, uh, in addition to all the famous people you've mentioned, John F. Kennedy yeah. uh, had a treatment there uh, in the 1940s for a particular illness that he contracted. So it is the go-to place. Uh, I've been in there once, but only just for a medical. I know that it was a pretty uh, posh experience. Um, and to think that that has happened to a, a woman who's uh, really having a tough time uh, and should be given ample space and opportunity to make a full and speedy and complete recovery it is vile in the extreme. So I do hope that uh, it has the, if this has happened, that the uh, culprit has been apprehended and will be suitably dealt with. Yes, well, certainly it, there's no question that it is an offence um, to access records, confidential records in a health um, situation. But I mean, no reputable uh, publication in this country would ever touch anything like that anyway, certainly wouldn't publish it. Um, so you can only presume that the person, if they were attempting to do something like this, was doing it at the behest, perhaps, of a foreign media organisation. Well, that could be, couldn't it? Uh, there are people abroad. These people abroad know nothing. They have no sense of responsibility. But that doesn't stop them uh, being prepared to uh, jump uh, like a tiger on a wounded lamb if it suits their purpose. 
they are irresponsible and they are disreputable. But we won't stop it because uh, we live in a free world and I and you were, were very much in favor of free speech. But of course, when you give people something, they will inevitably misuse it. And that's the tragedy of this particular story. Yes, absolutely right. And what have you made of this kind of craziness that seems to have broken out across social media, across the internet? You know, you and I are old enough to remember the days when uh, you didn't actually have such a thing as social media, didn't have such a thing as the internet, um, and words spread much more slowly. But it seems to have been turbocharged, this whole mad, crazed world that we now live in has suddenly got even more crazy in the last two weeks. It is actually appalling, Michael. I, I deprecate it in the extreme. Uh, these rumour mills will keep on churning uh, until there is uh, substantial on-the-record briefing. It, it doesn't do any good for Kensington Palace to identify friendly individual journalists and give them a briefing that so, at some future date. Uh, the Princess of Wales may, in an informal situation with members of the public, uh, divulge something uh, about the uh, treatment that she's undergoing and what really ails her at the moment. That really doesn't do because it just adds to uh, the tsunami of nastiness, vileness, uh, crack pottery uh, that is going on in, in social media. Now, social media, which is a wonderful thing, a wonderful invention, but it's turned into uh, an amalgamation of a piranha pool yeah. uh, and a cesspit because people are so vile to each other and they say things that they wouldn't dare to say to people's faces. Yes. Well, that is the true mark of the coward. And that's what we're seeing. Um, I would strongly recommend, if I were having anything to do with the Kensington Palace press office, which I don't think has been uh, very effective uh, for goodness sake, the fake uh, photo fiasco, something like that, good staff work would have prevented that ever happening. And perhaps maybe because it happened at the weekend, uh, it, it, it wasn't prevented. There's always got to be in every PR office an abominable no man. Somebody will say, no, that's a bad idea. And even to the principles they're working for, even to stop them, save them from themselves. And that clearly hasn't happened. And this is why this uh, rumour mill is going on. It is damaging, and I'm quite sure it's very unpleasant for the princess. I think the sensible thing to do would be for the princess to consult her doctors and to allow a brief uh, official health bulletin. We don't have to go into the details, but a simple statement of what uh, she is suffering uh, would suffice. Yeah. And perhaps that, after everything else, would stop the rumour mills. Because even with this um, this bit of film yesterday or on Saturday at the farm shop at Windsor, as you've said earlier, people are questioning that. Uh, the uh, son has come out mm. and answered them quite robustly, as you would expect it to do. But when you look at that uh, piece of film, uh, I mean, I spent half of my professional life, that's 30 years, filming people or being in uh, cutting rooms, looking at faces on film. Did that look to me like people, two people who knew they were being filmed? Uh, well, I'm afraid it did. Uh, so was this contrived? Well, I think the giveaway is that there were no detectives in the picture. Yes. Their close support, close protection people were not there. They would normally be there dogging their footsteps and they would be visible. Were they told to you know, stay in the background because we're going to do this little walk and perhaps a member of the public will see it and, and record it and perhaps that will scotch the rumours. Well, I'm afraid that won't scotch the rumours. It just feeds them. So I think uh, somebody's got to, get, got, to get a, get, got to get a grip in, in the PR offices at KP and Buckingham Palace and, and have, a, have a plan. There doesn't seem to be a plan at the moment. Uh, the, you know, the old train is ro rocketing down the rails with nobody uh, on the footplate. Yes, I think that is a big worry for an awful lot of people. Um, just to repeat, we're breaking the news here uh, tonight that uh, is in the Daily Mirror, in the paper tomorrow. Uh, the London Clinic currently investigating a situation where um, a member of staff 
somebody working at the London Clinic may have tried to obtain confidential medical records of Kate, Princess of Wales. We'll bring you more on that uh, coming up a little bit later on when the panel returns. But, Michael, stay with me, though, because we want to move on to the BBC, uh, your alma mater, as the corporation is planning to feature adverts around its audio output in the UK for the first time to the dismay, uh, quite rightly, of some rival commercial radio stations. The national broadcaster, which is funded to the tune of £3.8 billion a year, is working on proposals to introduce advertising on podcasts and on-demand radio shows when they are streamed on third-party services such as Spotify. Um, call me old-fashioned, I'm afraid, uh, Michael, but they shouldn't be on Spotify, should they? What on earth are they doing um, putting their shows onto commercial operations? This is utterly deplorable. I worked for the BBC and was proud to do so for more than 20 years, a fifth of its existence. But what I did recognise is that it's the greatest empire builder uh, since Rome at its greatest extent under Trajan in, in AD 117. Mm. Uh, it goes into areas it should not be in. It should never have been in local radio. Yeah. Uh, it, that should have been left to the commercial uh, world. Uh, and what is it doing with it, its commercial, its BBC radio stations in the in the provinces? It's killing the local media uh, by its antics. It's gobbling up their stories, yeah. putting them on the air, and, and making it life very, very precarious uh, for local newspapers. I've written a chapter in a new book, which is how do we fund, how do we pay for the BBC yeah. after two thousand and twenty-seven? And I've said. Uh, you have to destroy it in order to save it. You have mm. to break it up. Now, what you've told the viewers this evening is fascinating. If the BBC really wants to go into commercial radio, then it should hive off radios one and two uh, and, and become a proper a radio station like Capital or, or LBC or, or whatever it wants to be. Or TalkSport the, the talk... or, you know, uh, Virgin or Times Radio yeah. uh, or Talk Radio. Why not? If All you... in this building. If you, want to, if you want to be in the marketplace, be in the marketplace, but don't rely on the punter, you and me, the people paying £169, and that's going up, I think, in, in April, mm. uh, to, to in this unofficial, unspoken poll tax, uh, which we all have to pay. Or I pay. A lot of more people don't pay it, uh, of course. They just refuse. Uh, and uh, it's a dwindling market. Right. And the thing is, Michael... Um, when did you last see anybody under 25 uh, looking at BBC, listening to BBC? Yeah. They, they don't. They have their own uh, ways yeah, well, I mean, of, my, of my two, I've got two. I've got two teenage sons. Uh, they don't watch any kind of uh, what you would call linear television anymore. They watch everything pretty much uh, on TV, unless it's a live sporting event. That's all they watch, you know, and more and more of that is less likely to be on the BBC anyway. You, you make the point, you see... A BBC was a wonderful institution. It's had a hundred years. It's had a jolly good innings. Now is the time for the umpire to raise his finger and point uh, to the pavilion of yes. past triumphs. Mm. It must be broken up. It is unwieldy. It's an empire builder. Uh, and it's, should we say, it's the biggest baby in the pram and it's pushing all the other babies yeah. out. Well, exactly right. I'd pay good money, by the way, to see you dressed as an umpire standing outside Broadcasting House with your finger like that pointing to the pavilion. <laughs> I think that would be absolutely brilliant. Um, but the other, problem, the other problem, of course, is that some people have said, oh, hang on, this is only uh, a slight de deviation from what they do when they sell their services abroad. For example, uh, you know, if they want to sell their stuff to America, you know, that can be uh, filled with advertising if you're watching it. But they shouldn't really be doing that either because they're actually operating as a, as a commercial operation based on our investment. And we get no return on that investment. Absolutely. They've always been cack-handed when it comes to commercialism. Uh, I mean, they build a great big thing and a huge big <laughs> building block called BBC Enterprises. Uh, and at that time, Thames Television, if you remember Thames Television, they had uh, four salesmen on commission, and those four salesmen sold more programming than the whole of BBC Enterprises yeah. put together. Right. It, 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 Auntie cannot do that sort of thing. And when it tries, it makes itself look stupid. I think it has to go back to basics, slim itself down, uh, concentrate on the core, which is news and current affairs, uh, and quality uh, drama, 
uh, and productions that we can all respect. I mean, I am totally fed up with seeing its appalling dramas, the same 60 actors recycled yeah. time after time after right. time, and things going on long past their sell-by date. It's got to uh, be slimmed down and made more sleek and more competitive. At the moment, it just relies on us to pick up the bill. And every time it, it, it spends its money, it wants more. Because Michael, remember this, this is a unique corporation. It's the only corporation in the world ever set up not to make money, but to spend it. Yes, absolutely right. Couldn't agree with you more. Michael, great to see you. Great to talk to you as ever. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Michael Cole, of course. Uh, the man of the moment uh, who can talk about the royals with the same alacrity that he can talk about his former employer, uh, the BBC. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming next, though, another horrific XL bully attack where the police had to shoot the dog dead to save the victim. How on earth is this still happening? Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Now, police shot dead an out-of-control XL bully in Battersea in London last night after the vicious creature mauled four men who have all been taken to hospital. My panel uh, are still back with me. Uh, Ryan, Emma and Mike are all here. Uh, thanks for coming back in, guys. Let's start off with this uh, terrible XL bully story. Um, weeks after what was supposed to be the ban, weeks after... These dogs were supposed to be muzzled if you had one uh, or presumably, you know, sent somewhere into some sanctuary or other in maybe Wales or, or Scotland. But it's still happening, isn't it? Yeah, every, it seems like these stories happening every single week. Yeah. Um, and the answer is you take them off the, off the streets 
completely, yeah. or, or do you just give them the, or do you just muzzle them, and you know you keep them under under, under close control? Yeah. But it seems like the government made a real big song and dance yeah, over it, it on on the back of uh, a pretty emotive um, incident. And you just wonder whether they have to go further, which, well, which would anger a lot of dog owners. I mean, I don't know. I mean, do. you guys all live in London or, or in various parts of it. I mean, have you noticed that you don't see so many of them? Because I know there was a period of time, probably towards sort of autumn of last year, I seemed to see an awful lot of these dogs. Yeah, I and I don't see them around as much at the moment. I mean, that's completely anecdotal. But you'd quite often see people walking them because you'd always just go, blimey, that looks like a terrifically mm. vicious and ferocious And the dog. idea of muzzling them, I, to me, and I'm not an animal behaviourist in any, you know, surely that makes them even more aggressive when they do you escape, so. when they... Yeah. Because it's not natural for a dog to be no. muzzled. I can't imagine it's comfortable. No. It really feels, just like Ryan says, it feels as though these dogs actually need to be banned properly. Yeah. And yes, rehomed somewhere safe in a sanctuary, but, but stop the breeding, make it illegal yeah. to keep, to perpetuate. Yeah. I'm not saying kill them all now. No, of course. But to stop... I think the problem they've always had is that... How how do you prove that it is in fact a breed a breed that is 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 in fact illegal because they had this problem with pit bulls in the past where they would say well if it's a crossbreed then it doesn't come under the auspices of the breed mm. so that i think is the problem but according to this what eyewitness account footage of the scene showed one man this happened about 10 o'clock last night in battersea one man hitting the dog with a bike helmet while another one tried to cover it with a blanket i mean it sounds horrific really scary and all four of these guys ended up in hospital yeah. Just shocking. Um, two people have been arrested uh, on suspicion of having a dog dangerously out of control. But this is the problem. If you've got one of these dogs, they seem to be permanently dangerously out of I control. I suppose you, then you have to make sure that if they do, does go through the whole court process, that whether people are actually punish properly. Yeah, exactly right. Shocking stuff. Um, let me take you back to the breaking news we had just at the top of this hour. Uh, it's, it's a story in the Daily Mirror um, about Princess Kate and supposedly an investigation going on at the London Clinic yeah. because people or somebody has been trying to access her confidential notes. Very serious story for the London Clinic, this, if uh, if they find that somebody was trying to do that. Yeah, um, uh, total, you know, it could well be, a, it, well, it is, from, from looking at it, a, a, a breach of total, you know, patient confidentiality, mm. which if you work in the healthcare service, that's probably the first thing you sign right. up to, to actually make sure that right. people's, you know, conditions are, you know, uh, don't get out there. It's a per very frenzy, personal thing. It? This frenzy of, of, of uh, sort of... Activity and, and the, the numbers of people who are absolutely obsessed with this story that even after the, the video came out yesterday, they're not interested. No. They go, no, it's definitely not them. You know, they know everything. It's a bit like, you know, I used to get these people on my late night radio show who didn't believe that, you know, man landed on the moon. They didn't believe that 9 11 was. I know, and everything you say job. just feeds yeah. the conspiracy. And everything, you know, well, don't, well, of course, you, you must know that this happened, therefore, that must be true. Yeah. But let's not forget that the king is also being treated. It was, you know, he yes. was treated at the London Clinic. Right. This is a potential... And it's still being very, treated, we think. Very secure, yeah. you know, should be a very secure hospital. But can you imagine for a moment how vulnerable... I mean, we know that Kate must already be feeling vulnerable and, you know, under attack and under a lot of scrutiny. But the idea that someone... That, that your hospital, mm. where you've been treated, that they are, you know, that they have your medical records... Mm. As any patient, you know, not even a royal patient, not even the most right. famous woman in the world, because the frenzy in America, in America yeah. about, about Kate at the moment mm. is off the chart. It is. But imagine knowing they've got your medical records yeah. and that potentially a nurse, as we saw a few years ago when the Australian radio station that Michael was telling, Michael Cole was talking yeah. about, when the Australian radio station called up the nurses and got, and got private information. I don't know how Kate is coping with all this. Right yeah, I now. know. It must be horrific. I know, incredibly, st incredible stuff. Of course, um, and she's meant to be recovering. Mm, and the front page of the Sun uh, tomorrow has got still yet another Kate story. Uh, the pictures from yesterday, from the video, uh, and this is based around the guy who actually filmed it, um, who is a man by the name um, of Nelson Silver, who it turns out is a bit of a, 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 a film, a professional film director. Or something, which of course has fed the uh, uh, the trolls even more. Oh, yeah. Well, well, of course he's a professional film. Uh, oh, it's a body director. double, Mike. It's a so body double. So therefore, he must have set it up, and he must have sold it, and that's no, 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 no. But basically, he's now saying, "I saw them with my own eyes. And leave them alone." Mike, what do you make of it? <laughs> leave them alone, says the man who. Filmed I mean, it looks them. it looks pretty much unless it's generative AI or something like the Dutch, <laughs> like the Princess of Wales. Sorry, I'm still called Duchess of Cambridge. It looks like her. Um, it's great to see her out and about in public again. Haven't we done this story to death that, you know, at the end of the day, she's entitled to privacy yeah. when she recovers. She's due to come back out to public anticipated in a few weeks anyway. 
I hope she's going to resume. She's a big asset to the royal family, particularly given the turbulent times they're going through as well. For me, the focus is going to be on the king's health. Obviously, the fact he's still performing his duties and carrying on with that as well. But it's good to see her out about in Windsor there and with her husband. Yeah, on side. I mean, incredible, really, isn't it that uh, that this has become such a big story? I wonder. Um, I wonder if people are just so fed up with everything that this is the only thing they can kind of concentrate on. They almost you know, see it as... We can't a... talk about the serious problem with the so country. They're so popular, it's a bit we lighter. Can't, yeah, we can't, we can't possibly think about the state of the NHS or the yeah. dreadful state of our border force or anything like that. This, so let's, let's focus on this. I presume this is, for a lot of people, this is their escapism. This is their um, EastEnders Coronation Street. This is the, the, yes. the sort of the real-life version of that. But you would sort of just wonder whether the, the royal family or the, the household would sort of help themselves by not... Um, you know, they could have staged similar sort of pictures themselves, yeah. show, showing Kate's road careful. to recovery. Be careful um, what you say. Yeah. I mean, you know, somebody will start staging stuff. I mean, this is yeah. the thing. I mean, I'm joking, yeah. but, you yeah. know, people go, well, they said it on talk TV. It must but be I true. But also, I also think, um, as well as what you say about the, the, the sort of interest, I also think there's a, there's a level of genuine love, <laughs> sort of uh, affection for her and concern behind it. I hate all the conspiracy stuff, and I do think it's verging on bullying. But I think lots of people are also genuinely concerned and kind of interested in her recovery. Yeah. But there's a really good letter in The Sun, which I may quote. Um, let's just remember that they, she is... Um, the Princess of Wales is a public figure, not public property. Yes. And I think that's right, because I've been yeah. on shows where people are going, we have a right to know, we pay for them, we have a right to know. Yeah. And that may be, it may be our <laughs> friend Kev. Yeah. But I mean, I said, you know, come on. Yeah. We don't have a right to know. No. I actually think Charles and Kate have shared unprecedented yeah. personal information. You know, we have a right to know what kind of cancer it is. Yeah. No, we don't. I, no. think, I think one thing that was quite interesting over the weekend, um, a few of the, the Sunday papers were carrying stories that she will actually explain um, when the when the time yeah, is yeah. right about what has actually yeah, happened, sure. and you feel if like she wants that, to, you know, my to. life will not be improved or, no. or disproved, disapproved no. by by knowing or not knowing. Yeah, and I think if you know, you know? other people yeah. have had the same condition as uh, you know, conditional treatment as what she had, it might it might it might help people. It may well do. But uh, moving on to slightly less serious royal matters, um, President Trump has given an interview tonight in which he says that uh, if he becomes president, he's going to deport Prince Harry, uh, which I think it's got to be. Good for a laugh, but I just hope he doesn't bring him back here. Yeah. And yeah. I know, then it. we get him you know, back. Get him back. We don't want him back. Knocking on the door of Buckingham for you. Palace. How about we get him sent to Rwanda? There you, you know, go. Because here's a guy who says he wants to help, you know, exactly. people in, in countries around the world. He wants to have various foundations in Africa. Some of them are not running as well as perhaps they ought to. Yeah, maybe Rwanda's the place for him. I think it's a perfect place for him. He could build, he could help build some of the hostels that we that desperately need out in Rwanda. Of taxpayers' money, though. I would give him three grand. You give Harry three grand. grand. Yeah. Go away for yeah. sure. Voluntarily. He's not promised never to come back. It, it is <laughs> you know. funny though because Trump has talked. <laughs> Trump has talked about draining the swamp and yeah. you know cracking down on all this stuff. Right. We know. I think we know that Harry lied on those forms. Right. If, well, if any if any of the rest of us lied on our forms yeah. about cannabis use. We would not be allowed in. What I found fascinating was the Democrats have actually defended their uh, ability to give him uh, residential status, whatever he's got, because yeah. they said, oh, probably the claims in his book were all made up. But I don't think that's really much of a defence. That's really you know, a defence. Because if he was sitting there and they were saying, well, you said you took all these drugs, and now you're saying you just made it up for a book, mm. what else did he make up? Exactly. Very, very interesting indeed. Um, Mark Drakeford, I just want to mention this because of a, a stupid little thing I'm going to say about his, uh, his Twitter account. Today, it says uh, on his Twitter page, is Mark Drakeford's last day. We sat down with him to find out a bit more about his time in office. And this is a tweet from the Welsh Government. You'd like to think that the Welsh Government knew what it was like during his time in office because he was running the Welsh Government. But something I noticed today for the first time, which I didn't realise he'd changed, but he did about a year or so ago, he doesn't call himself Mark Drakeford on Twitter. He calls himself Priff Whiny Dog. Exactly. Right? Now, apparently that's Welsh for Welsh First Minister. It? Yeah. Well, it's Welsh for First Minister. But Priff Whiny Dog. That's I mean, isn't that's that ridiculous? I mean, I love no, and affection to the Welsh people and they're wanting to continue to speak a language that nobody can understand and cost taxpayers an absolute fortune, by the way, because they publish everything yeah. in two languages in, on the Welsh Government front and they, every road sign is in two languages. But Priff Whiny Dog, I think that's got to be... The Thank best the Twitter handle really. ever. Yeah, absolutely. I sent him a message saying, cheerio, Priff. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure which bit of it that no, means. Exactly. Has he replied yet? No, funnily enough. He doesn't block me either, which a lot of people do. <laughs> um, should we talk about um, children as young as 12 are going to be allowed to watch depictions of cannabis abuse in films 
under new guidelines from the BF BBFC, the, the, the censorship board. Um, but nudity and sex scenes are more likely to be upgraded to a 15. Well, it's bad news for the BBC, isn't it? Because they're always doing shows with nudity in them because they think it's going to it be good It feels like ratings. tinkering around the edges when, you know, 12-year-olds have got smartphones and we need to be thinking about the kind of content Literally. they access online as yes. well. I mean, I mean, you know, OK, you can never have a parental lock on iPlayer, but, you know... Something like 70% of little boys that start, that go into mm -hmm. secondary school have already seen online porn. Yeah. You know, violent, explicit online porn. Yes. Yeah, so uh, minor depictions of cannabis, you know... Or like... In, 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 a, in, a, in a TV programme, fair enough, OK, well... People you lying in bed together, you know, you can't watch that. Yeah, no, exactly right. Um, what about uh, the uh, Her Majesty's Revenue Service, uh, HMRC? They've decided that they're going to take off the summer. The thing that I find amusing about this is that they're not going to answer the phones for the summer, but the summer to them begins in April. Yeah, no, yeah. So they're yeah. going to stop answering yeah. the phones as of April the 8th. At the end of the tax year, when people yeah. kind of need HMRC. Yeah. April, April to September. Yeah, I mean, it's a long summer, that. that, that they say that if you've got a really complex case that someone will pick up the phone. But oh, I think if you're sending out the message... How do they know that, yeah, though, exactly. before you ring? Exactly. Um, Does it say complex case? You know, <laughs> It sends out a pretty... <laughs> yeah. I, I can't quite understand why they like, they would particularly do this. I mean, they should have a... Well, do you know, of one of their reasons for it, and this is you'd have to work in the public sector to get this, apparently one of their reasons for it is that whenever we stop using the phones, when we put the phones back on, we get a real surge of calls. So you we just going, turn them off. You think? So it's like we might as well like turn off any access that anybody's got uh, to HMRC, Revenue Customs, um, and then... But well, we, we have seen this. Place. We have seen companies making it so impossible, yeah. like banks, making it so impossible to get hold of anyone. Yeah. Sometimes you get automated phone lines where they literally won't even give you a way yeah. of getting through. You just I had keep this, being I had directed online. I recently with my online. local council. I need to talk to somebody. Yeah. And it took me literally about three days to yeah. finally find somebody that I could call. Yeah. But even then, they had to call me back. Mm. And I had to be in for sort of three hours mm. in a window so they could talk to me. But they were basically telling me for two days, well, we can't put you through to anyone. So we're using a chat bot now instead of the phone lines. I mean, you can't ring HMRC as it is already. You know, if, if they get lots of late self-assessment right. you know, and fall in revenue, it's only their own Well, call. I mean, if it turns out that they haven't been able to s s sort of find you in time, or mm. they start, I think you should just say, well, I'm not paying a fine because you wouldn't answer the mm. phone. Mm. And what annoys me as well is when you do try and get, you do finally get hold of someone, they say, can you send us an email? We'll yeah. have a look into it. It's like, well, that's going to take that's another two did, weeks. Yeah, exactly right. Anyway, listen, we've got much more, much more to do. We've got more from the front pages and inside as well coming up. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Uh, we're going to chat to the panel about all of that. Plus, we're going to find out why people are kicking off in Blackpool during our trip to the world of woke. Do not go anywhere. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republican Mike Graham on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The World of Woke. Now, Blackpool is famous for many things. The Golden Mile, the Illuminations, the Blackpool Tower, the Pleasure Beach, and miles and miles of sand. It was also once the Stag and Hen Party headquarters of the United Kingdom. More recently, however, things have taken a turn for the worse. And Blackpool is now less likely to be a holiday destination than a town in England with the lowest life expectancy. Or perhaps the place with the worst drug problems in the country. But fear not, all is not lost because the council have come up with a plan. Not a plan to clamp down on their growing heroin use or drug dealing. Not a plan to reduce the numbers of people dying young on the streets of Blackpool. Nothing so simple for them, I'm afraid. No, they decided to put in some multicoloured crossings to replace zebra crossings. Why? Are they so bored of black and white stripes? Apparently so. But there is a method in their madness. Uh, they are part of a number of planned civic improvements to develop a be who you want to be area where presumably people can be who they want to be while crossing a particularly garish road crossing that looks like someone has spilled a load of paint on it. According to the Labour-run council, the colours used on the crossing are those of the Progress Pride flag, which according to them celebrates inclusivity for the LGBTQ plus community. They've also still got tactile paving services, crossing control push buttons, and tactile cones on the crossing control boxes. No word on whether they're rainbow coloured as well. The council says contractors Uniplay worked through the night to make the colourful transformation in a show of solidarity for a long established LGBTQ plus community uh, and its history. No word on whether they've spent the same amount of money on fixing the potholes. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that rainbow wrap lighting, whatever that is, has also recently been installed on a lamppost in the area. And get this, they are shining bright the message of inclusivity over the streets. Brilliant. You'd think with all the financial problems facing councils this year, the bankruptcy declarations, the removal of bin collectors and other council services, they might have a bit more to worry about, especially in one of Britain's poorest seaside towns. But wait, you'd be right, because they have. The council have also warned that part of Blackpool Beach might be lost forever if they can't get the £11 million from the Environment Agency to combat the ravages of, you guessed it, climate change. Apparently, the rising sea levels and more extreme storms mean a part of Anchor's home beach could be at risk. Sounds like a good reason to give them even more public money, because that is the world of work. The world of work. I mean, I'm sorry, but I just remember when councils used to empty the bins and, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, the streets were reasonably clean. Now they're worried about rising sea levels and um, making zebra crossings more colourful. That zebra crossing made me feel a bit queer. It's quite yeah, weird, because, isn't it? because when you look at it, you, you don't quite know where yeah. you're going to stand and put your feet, actually. No. And also, do you know one of the big problems, particularly for the police, actually, is the police horses don't, won't cross them. Right, yeah. Because they, fright, they literally frighten the horses. And I've never met a single gay person who said that they felt excluded from crossing a regular zebra crossing, or that they felt more included or more accepted <laughs> or... <laughs> I, know. I mean, really, it's, just it's kind of patronising. It's virtue signalling and it's a waste yeah. of money. And, and as for, you know, rainbow lighting, I've just got no idea what that is. I think tactile crossings are important for blind people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that stuff is important because often road surfaces, you don't know, you yeah. know, they have pavements yeah, that aren't yeah. pavements anymore. So yeah. they do need that kind of thing or if you're right. in a wheelchair, that... Well, that's practical, that though, help. isn't it? That's yeah. of some use. That's including so, I mean, the right people. If you happen people. to be a blind gay person, you don't care what 
colour the bloody crosses, there's any, do you? There's only one zebra crossing improvement I want, just taking one of those electronic piano mats and turning that into a zebra crossing. Oh, that, that would be that, fun. That would brighten everybody's day. That would be nice. That, that, yeah, that would be, that would be very dangerous. <laughs> no one would, no one would, ever, no one would ever get off it. Tom Hanks, yeah, exactly right. A um, couple of big stories that we haven't covered yet. Page one of the Metro, quite important this one, I think, mm. but horrible. Sex offender who sent naked images of himself to a 15-year-old girl and a woman aged 60 has become the first person in Britain convicted of cyber flashing. I mean, what a dreadful thing to do. Unsolicited pictures sent to a teenager, or anybody really. Um, I'm quite glad they've locked this guy up. This, this was really bad. The guy had already, so when he was convicted, Nicholas Hawkes, mm. he had already been convicted of sexual activity, sexual crimes in, in person with a minor, with a, with a, with a child under 16. Right. He'd sent these pictures to a, a grown woman and to a, to a minor, and the thing about um, cyber flashing, it sort of sounds quite, you know, uh, trivial, but it's mm. really not, and it's right. usually the gateway for people to then, who then go yes. on and commit crimes in person. Right. So it's really, really, it's not just images that make you feel violated and, and threatened right. and, and upset. It's actually the fact that these men almost always go on to actually act out those yes. crimes. But good know. to see the police are actually doing something yeah, yeah. I'm six about six something weeks. dangerous that does happen rather than just arresting people for saying, you know, hurty words to people on Twitter. Yeah. You know, they're listen, actually going after people doing horrible stuff. This is, as you say, was, was it just a few months ago, was it? Yeah. Was it? Yeah, so, I mean, they, they have acted... But he was a convicted quite, sex offender. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I don't know why he wasn't in prison. I don't know why he was allowed online, but we don't know the answers to that. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, another one which is a bit um, of bad Im image-making, I suppose, for British Airways, BA Cabin Crew's racist TikTok video... Uh, this is on page 17 of The Sun. They call it this. Two British Airways cabin crew were sacked yesterday for mocking Asian passengers in a video. I mean, what are people thinking? I mean, you make a video, it goes viral, you release it to the public. What do you, you think's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, and the reputational da damage to uh, a company like British Airways. Yeah. You know, if that, that, you know, TikTok... Who are, who are struggling enough at the moment. Yeah, that, space that video does go around the world and, uh, you know, people, you know, rightly, deeply offended by it, but they've acted extremely quickly... And, and they've sacked them. Yeah, and as, as, as indeed they should. Story about the election, which is in the sun, by two of your colleagues. Yes. Um, it says, Jeremy Hunt, yesterday let's slip that Britain is heading for an October general election. Um, I was saying earlier that, um, that Harry Cole, political editor, your colleague as well, has said yep. it's going to be October 17. Yeah, this was uh, Jeremy Hunt this afternoon. He was speaking at the Lord's Economics Committee and he let slip that, um, that talking about when a spending review could take place. And he said, well, if you have an election in October, it means the, the next government after the election could probably have a spending review by the April. I just wonder whether he said that because Rachel Reeves is making a big speech um, tonight and he yeah. just wanted to set hairs running a little bit and take the focus away from her. Um, but, That's yeah, he, he perhaps didn't have to say that election date that could be in October, right. possibly, maybe, right. but he did. And, because, uh, he again, it's one of these things, they must know, they must have a date in their yeah, mind. It's not they like they're going to go into the summer recess and go, well, what do you think? I don't know. They've got a couple of dates they were working on. They were working on the basis of November the 14th, not that long ago. It does seem to have shifted slightly to October. So I think we're looking at that sort of month, yeah. six-week window. OK. And, and just for good measure, we may as well give him a plug. Harry's doing a new show, Never Mind the Ballots, it says here. Yeah. Uh, starts tomorrow, 8pm, on the Sun YouTube channel. Um, it's also going out, I think, on Talk TV around about uh, Thursday as well. So yeah. um, a lot going on in the yeah. world of politics at the Sun. Yeah, Harry's going to be in it, Kate. I think myself and Noah and yeah. Jack and well, Martina, don't the whole team. Time the whole the, <laughs> don't leave time for the Independent Republic. <laughs> no, you know, exactly. you know defecting <laughs> And the talk. Um, and to talk as well, of course. Um, final one, I suppose... Um, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Apparently, there's a red alert now being issued by the, um, the UN. Apparently, we're, we're not doing enough to stop the climate change from destroying the planet. Um, I'm going to pay no attention whatsoever to the red alert because uh, I'm sick of hearing them. And apparently, if all this stuff we're doing isn't having any effect, then we might as well stop doing it, right? Do you know what? The weather feels pretty normal to me. I mean, I know I'm going to be slammed by all the climate change scientists, yeah. but it feels quite normal. Some days it's raining, some yeah. days it's quite cold, some days it's quite warm. Yeah. Today was quite spring-like. Yeah. Yesterday was quite wet. It sort of swings and roundabouts. Exactly right. Couldn't have put it better myself. Uh, that's all from us. <laughs> You've been watching The Independent Republic, Mike Grant. Thank you to all of my guests. I will see you at 8 p.m. tomorrow, only on Talk TV.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from King City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the 